Hello. I'm going to read chapter, at least probably two more chapters of our lovely book. Mr. Nolan Haddad is going to start doing what he needs to do. Chapter 15 is day six at 5.35 p.m. The theft of their last meal changed the castaways' approach to food. No longer could they depend on the 11th hour runs for coconut and bananas to stand between them and malnutrition. They needed protein, they needed vegetables, they needed well-balanced meals. The equipment from the survival pact helped. Suddenly, they had pots and pans. They could fish and cook what they caught. Even durian seeds were tasty when roasted over the fire. Two fork, two fork sticks with a cross piece allowed a pot to be hung over the flame by its half loop handle. This enabled them to boil taro, a native root, which resembled a cross between a yam and an overloaded electrical junction box. You know, said JJ in genuine surprise, this isn't half bad. It's almost like mashed potatoes. It gets very soft when boiled, Ian agreed, but you have to cook it well to kill off the poisonous chemicals that could be fatal to humans. Nolan, come back to your desk. I'm not trusting you up there today, okay? Come sit at your desk, sir. Well, then you can come sit on this wall where everybody's smart in their own way, facing me, not facing Nolan, not facing Olive. Not facing Landon, I mean. JJ spit a mouthful halfway across the beach. It's fantastic, Bean Luke, digging in. The only thing that tastes better than prepared food by your own hands is food prepared by somebody else's. Toro was plentiful. The fresh water to boil it, wait, the fresh water to boil it in was very scarce. While it seemed to be raining constantly, it never rained for very long. No matter how many coconut shells the castaways set out, now over 100, the yield was never more than an inch or so. Ian tried rigging a still, something he had seen in National Geographic Explorer. They boiled a pot of seawater under a three-sided plastic tent made from a rain poncho. The water vapors rose as steam, recondensing on the sides of the tent. Then the droplets ran down the inside of the plastic and collected in three bowls on the ground. The salt was left behind in the pot. This was fresh water. Seems like a lot of work for a dribble, commented JJ. You got a busy social calendar? Laughed Liza. I could have, sighed the actor's son in California. That's why you got kicked out of California, Luke butted in. You were having too much fun. JJ glared at him. But he had to admit, Luke wasn't exaggerating much. His reputation as a wild Hollywood brat had grown almost as large as his famous father's movie career. Gossip columnists used to call to ask about dad. Now they wanted details of J.J.'s latest escapade. It had been a great source of satisfaction to him. His brow clouded until Jonathan Lane had chosen CNC in the hope that it might straighten out his flaky son. How could he do this to me? He screamed at his father in tortured dreams every night. But the next morning, he always awoke knowing that his that he'd given a da- his dad a lot of help making the decision. Their social calendars may have been blank, but the castaways had plenty to keep themselves busy. Two patrols per day, morning and afternoon, were dispatched to comb the jungle for signs of Will and his camp. His Will or his camp. They all took turns searching, with Liza leading the group every time. Ian B built three more stills, so one person had to maintain the fires and keep adding seawater to the pot. This assignment also included emptying the bowls of freshly distilled water into the lifeboat's keg. Each fishing trip began with a sprinted a sp- Spirited round of rock, paper, scissors to determine who would perform the disgusting task of baiting the hooks. This was a job nobody wanted because, as Luke put it, the worms are bigger than the fish. Carla, or Charla, didn't use bait at all. She preferred the challenge of swimming in the ocean and snarling her fish with a quick, a lightning quick hand. JJ volunteered for fishing every day, but spent very little time with his hook in the water. He had discovered sea cucumbers and was fascinated and delighted by their life process. Picture a bag of guts with a hole at each end, he explained. The water goes straight through it. But when some poor sap gets beached, it just sits there, full of water. Watch this. He picked up the creature, aimed it like a water pistol, and squeezed. Instantly, the sea cucumber emptied itself in a thin stream that hit Charla full in the face. She pushed JJ into the surf and he and held him under. Liza hurled him out of the drink. 
Guess Charla isn't interested in marine biology. She sympathized. Ian was in charge of food gathering because he was the only person who could tell what was edible. The good news was the food was everywhere, even on the walls of their home. They would wake up each morning to find a lifeboat covered in giant snails. They're a delicacy, you know, Ian told them, gathering an arm lobe and a good source of protein. In your dream, said everybody. Okay, so every morning their lifeboat is covered in snails, which coincidentally are, um, you can eat snails. They're called escargot, fun fact. But after bananas and coconuts three times a day, most of them were ready to try anything. When she wasn't in the jungle looking for her brother, Liza spent most of her time tinkering with the lifeboat's scorched and broken radio. She was a straight-A student with a real knack for electronics and machinery. They were surviving, keeping busy, overcoming obstacles. The depression would come suddenly, unexpectedly, without warning. Charla might reach up to smooth her hair, feel that stiff, salt-encrusted tangle, and burst into tears. The crying would sometimes last for hours. Or Ian would grow suddenly silent and sit for half a day, staring morsely out to sea, visualizing who knew what. And any mention of Will could set Liza off. For JJ, it would start innocently enough. He'd be talking about a great pizza place he'd known in L.A. But then, 45 minutes later, he'd be sitting there on the sand, his arms wrapped around himself, straight jacket style, still mumbling about double cheese and pepperoni. Charla ate Lex, exercised more, and blew up at anybody who dared mention it. Why don't you just keep on swimming, JJ suggested. At your pace, you could hit the Oregon coast in another three years. I should hit your ugly face with another three seconds, she retorted. Take it easy, Sooth Luke. JJ turned on him, blue eyes blazing. Who died and left you, God? And before Luke knew it, he was shouting, The captain did. That's who. And if you hadn't decided to run up the sails in a gale, he'd be alive. And we'd still have a boat, and none of us would be having this conversation. Luke watched the angry satisfaction as JJ's face drained all watched in angry satisfaction as JJ's face drained of all color. It was one topic JJ couldn't smirk away. The tears were already on the edge when he started running. At the edge of the trees, he turned and spat a single word back at Luke. Convict. Because remember, Luke had been in trouble, and that's why he got sent on this boat trip. And then Luke was chasing him, intent on war, but the low vines tripped him and he landed hard. Raging at the sky. No. Wasn't this just perfect? Now. Now. Of all the times. Everyone was going nuts. Didn't they see they just had to hold it together if they were going to find Will and get off this rock? Why can't they be more like me, Luke thought. I'm calm. Steady. Balanced. Sensible. At the sudden pain in his hand, he looked down. His knuckles were skinned and bleeding. With each thought, he had been having a boxing match with the tree trunk. Sensible and steady. Yeah, right. J.J. didn't reappear until later that night. He stepped into the lifeboat, tapped Luke on the shoulder. I'm on fishing tomorrow. Okay, replied Luke. I'll work the stills. For once, he was grateful there were so many chores. There was one final task that all the castaways kept up day to day. No matter what other job was in progress, five pairs of ears were always listening for the drone of airplane engines that would mean the smugglers were leaving the island. Until those men were gone, the ship wreckage crew of the Phoenix could not light signal flares or write distress messages in the sand. They would never be rescued if they continued being forced into hiding. When are they going to scram? asked Liza in exasperation. They've got their tusks and their horns. What are they waiting for? That's what we have to find out, Luke said. So the next morning, Luke and Charla set off for the other side of the island to spy on the unwanted neighbors. Two hours later, they returned trembling. They're searching the jungle, Charla asked. They've got the Doberman sniffing the ground to pick up our scent. You mean they know we're here? Asked Liza in horror. The dog definitely smells something when it sniffs someplace we've been, Luke told them. But those guys can't be sure what they're looking for. The island's not that big, Ian said nervously. Sooner or later, I mean, even if it's by dumb luck. He never finished the sentence. He didn't have to. The five castaways stood rooted in the sand as the thought began to sink in. They were being hunted. Oh my gosh, these poor people's lives are terrible. All right, we are on chapter 16. It is now day nine. Oh my gosh, they've been there for over a week, and it is 10, 10 a.m. They called it the two-minute drill. The signal came from Charla, atop a palm tree, the hooting of an owl, a sound that would never be heard on a tropical island. That set the vanishing process in motion. The fires were extinguished, the stills folded up and buried in the sand. A few sweeps of giant ferns, and their footsteps were gone too, leaving a deserted beach. Two quick kicks took care of the supports for the sun canopy, and the lifeboat lay flat, 
Ready hands drew a leafy blanket of woven vines and palm fronds over it. Suddenly, the black rubber craft was gone, replaced by green-brown colors of the jungle. Finally, the castaways themselves disappeared, melting into the dense underbrush. So what they're doing is they're doing a drill because they're being hunted by these guys. Well, um, they don't. The guys don't know they're looking for people. They just know they're looking for something. So they're doing this drill to make themselves disappear as fast as possible if the guys end up coming close to them. There was an electric beep of the digital stopwatch. 1.57, Ian reported, our best time yet. Subtle cheering and a few back slaps as the heads popped up again. Luke wasn't happy. We can make ourselves disappear, but we can't hide our smell. The dog's nose won't be fooled. Ian looked thoughtful. What if we set out a few fish heads and tails and guts on the beach? That would be strong enough scent to confuse the dog. It'll, ga- it'll also gas us out of here, Liza noted, making a face. We can keep it wrapped up in one of the ponchos, Luke decided, and we'll open it when we hear the signal. It was agreed that two-person scout teams would be dispatched to keep an eye on the smugglers. Liza objected. This would distract them from the search from Will, but the others overruled her. They hadn't seen Will in five days and had no idea where he was. For all, th- for all they knew, he was on the other side of the island where the float panes were beached. They were as likely to spot him there as anywhere. That's another reason to spy in those guys, Luke argued, to make sure they haven't found Will. Luke and Ian had been scouting for over an hour before they spotted the Doberman. They immediately pulled back, ducking behind the dense strand of fern. Red hair had the dog on a leash. And two other men were with them. All three were armed. You were right, whispered Ian. They're looking for something. They followed along for a while, making sure that nothing was moving in the direction of the castaways' camp. When the dog began to run in circles, barking excitedly, they knew they had to retreat. Ian frowned. Three of them out here? How many are on the... How many are with the planes. Luke shrugged. One way to find out. They backtracked, staying low. They eased themselves down the slopes to their spying place overlooking the cove. The two boys counted and delivered their tallies at the same time. Three. Two on the beach and Mr. Big sitting half in, half out of the smaller plane. They couldn't see his face, but his thick legs and white suit identified him. In all this time, no one, not one of the trackers had changed clothes, which meant They weren't planning on staying here, Luke whispered. They're only hanging around to make sure no one else is on the island. Ian was confused. Where do they sleep? There's no campsite. They can't all fit in the planes. Not lying down anyways. It was a good question. They eyeballed every inch of the cove. Time out. There was the lagoon, a a rocky jetty, a narrow beach, and coral bluffs leading up to the edge of the jungle. No camp. We're missing something, Luke murmured. And then he saw the footprints in the sand. They were mostly heading in one direction. They ended where the beach did, of course, but Luke could envision a trail leading up the slope and into the jungle. The entry port was perhaps a quarter mile from where he and Ian lay hidden. There had to be something there, something that was important to these men. Carefully, silently, they picked their way around the apron of the cove. The jungle became so dense that they were doing more wading than walking. Their progress slowed to almost nothing. That was why Luke didn't injure him. That was why Luke didn't injure himself when he bumped straight into it. A wall? Ian guessed. Three steps before, it had been invisible. Knit into fabric of the rainforest, but here it was. A covered metal siding of a... One set? Hut. A big one. Ian and Luke stared at each other in mute wonder. Their island, isolated, deserted, and empty of any hint of civilization, had a building on it. It was mind-blowing. Luke put his finger to his lips, and the two of them crept down the length of structure. Cautiously, they turned the corner and found themselves facing a gray metal front with a door and two windows. A rusted sign faded, barely legible, read, United States Army Air Corps. An Air Force bake, Luke breathed, in the middle of the jungle? Ian pointed to the sign, Army Air Corps. They haven't been called that for 50 years. This area could have been clear back then, and the jungle just grew up around it. Luke slid up to the streaked and smeared windows and peered in. The jungle was growing in there, too. Blasted up through rotted floor planking. There was no one inside. Let's check it out, he whispered. 
They opened the door. Someone had recently oiled the hinges and slipped through. Desks, chalkboards, filing cabinets, yellow old papers, file folders were scattered everywhere. Look, Ian exclaimed. Sleeping bags were spread out on the old benches. A few beer bottles, empty food cans, and dozens of cigarette buds littered two desks that had been pushed together. The place smelled of stale smoke. This was the traffickers' campsite, all right. This... What was it? Military? Definitely. Old and abandoned for sure. But a base? It was more like an office. Ian touched Luke's arms and pointed to a bulletin board suspended from one of the curved walls. Tacked up, there were folded diagrams of a hut exactly like the ones they were standing in. Two other huts much smaller stood behind it. These three buildings seemed to be the extent of the installation. Did they have bases this small? Luke asked. The younger boy shrugged and drew Luke's attention to something else on the board. A map of the Pacific. Tiny pins represented boats and planes were stuck all over the chart. Fallen ones lay on the floor in front of it. World War II, he noted. There were a couple of private offices and farther back barracks room with lines of bunks. Luke wondered why the smugglers were sleeping on hard benches when real beds were right there. When he got closer to the mattresses, they were ripped to shreds and alive with thousands of bugs. He shuddered and returned to where Ian was flipping through file folders. Find anything? Ian shook his head. Requesting for toilet paper and shaving cream. They needed a part for the movie projector in 1945. He picked up an envelope marked Top Secret that had once been closed with an important looking seal. A dozen or so staple pages were inside. The first line caught his eye. Read, like read. Deployment of Junior. His eyes widened like saucers. Junior? Junior, reported Luke. Who's Junior? The sound they heard next drove every other thought from their minds. The barking of a dog. They ran for the door. Gruffing voices outside. The men were right there. Luke grabbed Ian and spun him around. The terror was plain in the young boy's eyes. He mouthed the words, back door? As they spread to the rear of the building, Luke knew that the answer to the question would mean the difference between life or death. Heart sinking, he faced the back wall. No door, just two windows, jammed and wrapped, warped. The first one wouldn't budge. The smugglers cladding in the front door, accompanied by their barking dog. Shut up, mutt, came from an unfriendly growl. The second window moved only an inch before seizing up against a thick vine. Ian began to shake. That was when Luke looked down. The metal wall of the hut had become away from decaying floor about eight inches. It was their only chance. Desperately, he shoved Ian into the gap and followed. The two wriggled through to the outside and crawled off into the jungle. There was no running. The foliage was far too thick. But however slow, it felt like escape. Desperate movement propelled by panic. And when the underbrush thinned, they sprinted headlong, tripping and falling and getting up to run some more. They were halfway home before Luke managed to get his hands on Ian's shoulder to slow the boy down. Ian, he panted. What was all that back there? Who's Junior? Still clutching the top secret envelope and papers, Ian struggled to touch his breath. A bomb, he wheezed finally. An atomic bomb. Okay. Now these poor people got a bomb to deal with, potentially. That was happened. That was out during World War II. So guess what? The smugglers are still there. Now the smugglers are looking for them. They found these buildings, though. Which, maybe if the smugglers leave, then they could go to the buildings. I have no idea. But, anyways, we are going to stop there for today. Thank you for listening.